You're listening to the Trailblazers podcast, episode 69, with Dr. Maisha Taylor and Haley Taylor Schlitz. You're listening to the Trailblazers podcast, where we will explore the stories of successful Black professionals. Join us as we highlight the knowledge, resources, and tools of these accomplished trailblazers to help provide the know-how, confidence, and motivation you need to blaze your trail. And now, here's your host, Stephen Hart. Hello, and welcome to the Trailblazers podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Hart. In today's episode... I talk with Dr. Maisha Taylor and her daughter, Haley Taylor Schlitz. Now, Dr. Taylor, if you're not familiar, is a board certified uh, physician in emergency medicine. Back in 2012, in an effort to mentor and support women physicians of color globally, she founded the Artemis Medical Society. And that's now become an organization of over 3,700 women of color physicians. She was honored by Disney for the hit cartoon show, Doc McStuffins, For those of you who are parents of young kids and know of the show, the mom in Doc McStuffins was named Maisha in honor of Dr. Taylor. And today, we also had this unique spin. Uh, We brought on Dr. Taylor's daughter, Haley Taylor Schlitz, on on the episode as well. Haley is a 14-year-old college student, right? And she's majoring in chemistry with the goal of obtaining a medical degree like her mom. Uh, In today's episode, we had a great discussion. We talked about why awareness is so important for women of color in medicine. Dr. Taylor shared advice on informing and educating our children. And she talked about some of the mistakes we as parents are making. And she shared her her secret investment, if you will, uh, that helped Haley propel to now succeeding in college at at the age of 14. Um, Before we get into today's conversation, I wanted to give a shout out to all our mommy trailblazers. This episode actually goes live. Uh, a day after Mother's Day. And so I just want to wish all our moms a happy Mother's Day. Um, Even if it's the day after my two-year-old tells his mom happy Mother's Day year round. And, you know, I think it's it's good practice to celebrate our mothers each and every single day, not just this one day each year, right? So to all our mamas, thank you for all you do. I appreciate you. I love you. And, you know, one other thing I wanted to talk about quickly is that, listen, if you guys are focused on becoming trailblazers in your homework and community. I want to welcome you and invite you to become part of our trailblazer family, right? As a trailblazer, one of the first things I'd love to invite you to do is to help us get the word out to other future trailblazers, right? You can do this today by logging into iTunes and leaving a quick rating and comment for this podcast. Doing that actually helps the trailblazer community to grow and become noticed by others who want to join in this movement. And, um, you know, one last reminder, you've got access to the full show notes page for today's episode. You can hop on over right now to TB pod.com and get all those resources um, available to you right there that said let's go ahead and get set to receive today's mission fuel from our featured trailblazers dr maisha taylor and her daughter Haley taylor schlitz hope you enjoy Ladies, welcome, and thank you for being our guests on today's show. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Very excited. So, Dr. Taylor, you come from a long line of strong and inspiring women. Your mom and your grandmother were both nurses, right? Yes. And so, you know, I was curious to know, you know, as a kid, why Mm -hmm. did you aspire to become a doctor, you know, versus following the path, following their path, right, and becoming a nurse like your mom and grandmother? Right. You know, that's a great question. So my my grandmother was an LVN, which is kind of like an assistant to a registered nurse. And my mom decided to become an RN at my grandmother's urgent, urging. And my um, my mother, she was a nurse and my grandmother at a time where doctors were, well, nurses were kind of seen as subservient mm-hmm. to doctors in her mind and her experience. And she would tell stories about how you know, she was mistreated, she felt, and she aspired for me more. And she saw it, they both saw it as generational progress to have me um, become a physician. So I never really entertained 
a career in nursing. My mom went straight to medicine. Doctors are the leaders of the healthcare team, or at least they should be, and not other interests. And so I think that she just kind of wanted to see her daughter as a team leader. And she saw my personality and she encouraged me to do that. So I never, I never really thought about nursing. You know, it's interesting you say that because my wife, Kristen, her grandmother was a nurse um, Mm -hmm. here in in D.C. And Mm -hmm. her mom is, is a radiologist Mm -hmm. And Kristen wanted to pursue nursing herself Mm -hmm. and her mom talked her out of it. And, you know, years later, she's doing, you know, my wife is is doing a great job at what she's doing right now. But she always has this heart like, you know, she feel like it's something that she missed out on. And recently her mom has been expressing to her she the regret of not allowing her to pursue that passion of hers. But yeah. I'm curious that, you know, like I wonder if any any of that thought, you know, may have may have influenced that back then. Maybe. Maybe. I mean my mom I mean nurses and doctors and people don't realize this a lot, but they're very different careers and your role on the healthcare team is very, very different. Right. And the nurses are more hands-on. They interact with the patients more. As a physician, you kind of come up with the plan and the nurses execute that plan. And you might be with a patient for 10 minutes, maybe 30 minutes if you're not operating or doing a procedure. And it's the nurse that becomes the face of right. medicine for the patient. And that can be good and bad, right? I mean, yeah. if, if you are not the type of person that likes to to help people in that way where you're kind of nursing them, which is very hands-on and, uh, and emotionally draining because you're the one that's there taking the brunt of a sick patient, yes. then, you know, it's just not fun. So for me and my personality, I enjoy, you know, kind of walking into the room and spending 10 or 15 minutes <laughs> with a patient and then saying, okay, well, now, now let me get your nurse. You know, your nurse will walk <laughs> right. you through all the paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So in 2012, I think my daughter at that point in time was probably two, uh, just mm-hmm. about. But, you know, you were honored in a tribute by Disney. Um, mm-hmm. They announced that they were going to name the mother character of mm-hmm. Doc McStuffins, uh, Maisha, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I'm certain that had to be a tremendous honor for you and, and for your family, right? Mm-hmm. Wh- what did you think about that, Haley? H- how old were you at the time? Oh, that's hard. I, was, <laughs> I think, like, what was I? Five oh, years? Ten. Wow. Yeah, nine. Nine years old. What was that like for you? It was amazing to see that after how hard my mom had worked right. to reach her goals and uh, she communicated with other doctors and did collages and after everything she did that she got honored that way was just so inspiring and amazing. Right. That's awesome. What did that mean for you, Dr. Taylor? You know, why is awareness, right, so important for for women of color in medicine? You know, it's very important for multiple, multiple reasons. One, specifically with this show, it was important for the children to Mm -hmm. see an image of a brown little girl who aspires to be a physician and be able to identify that with physician and not another member of the healthcare team, right. a physician, the team leader. I think that's important. The show also explains to kids the process of going to the doctor and it demystifies that entire experience for them, yes. which is helpful. So because of this image and the children and the children's parents, when I go into a room now, as a brown girl doctor, the children are, oh, she's like Doc McStuffin. Right. And it immediately changes the dynamic within the room. There's no question now whether or not I'm the doctor or you're a doctor like a PA or a doctor like a nurse. Right. No, I'm the doctor like the doctor, right. <laughs> you know, <Right. laughs> period. And so that's, that's fantastic. But in another way, it also shows everybody, all children and the adults that love them, that they too can be physicians and they're not limited to stereotypical roles because this image has demonstrated that maybe the stereotype is not what we initially thought it was. Right. And I mean, you've had a terrific career to this point, as Haley just mentioned a minute ago. You know, I'm curious to hear, you know, what's what's maybe some of the biggest lessons you've learned, both as a doctor and as a mother, you know, that you find yourself applying in, in, in life today? I think the biggest lesson is to seek good counsel. In the ER, I 
consult with physicians all the time. If somebody comes in and they're having a baby, I'm on the phone with ob If someone is, you know, if it's a child, I'm on the phone with pediatricians to mm-hmm. ask, hey, am I missing anything? What do you think? This is your area of expertise. Well, same with children. You know, I'm a part of a lot of groups. And if I aspire to do something for my kids, like, you know, with Haley, um, homeschool, or actually all three of my kids I homeschool. I sought out people who successfully homeschooled and I asked them what worked, what didn't, and tailored my approach around proven methods that were off the beaten path. So I think that the one thing that I do as a mom and as a doctor well is I ask for help. <laughs> right. You need to. That's a, that's a busy role to you know, to be working as a doctor and you, you're in emergency medicine. Definitely we'll be coming back to that here in a second, <laughs> for sure. Haley, you know, how would you describe your mom as a parent? Well, number one, she's extremely inspiring. It just goes to show, especially when Dr. McStuffins wasn't out, that I could be anything I wanted to be. Right. Um, when it was harder for, I mean, it's never really been hard for me to find role models that look like me and my mom because of the Internet. But I can imagine if I didn't have the Internet, she is a great inspiration and role model for me to see that I can be a doctor if I wanted to. I can be anything I wanted to. And as a parent, she is very thoughtful and has a lot of insight and gives me a lot of hints and of what to do and where I should go. And she's always there when I get in trouble. And she's a great parent and, you know, just an extreme inspiration for me. I love that. (laughs) I I guess I don't tell her what to do. I give her hints. (laughs) (laughs) So Haley, you know, obviously I've seen that, you know, you you also want to pursue a career in medicine. Is that correct? Yes. That's that's awesome to to think that, you know, this would be the fourth generation of <laughs> of your family in the medical field and that's just amazing. In in what other ways, right, have have your parents influenced you the most? Besides in education and medicine wise, uh, they've just ins- they've inspired me in so many other ways and in, in the most basic ways in life as well. Just that uh, how my mom is a doctor, a wife, a mother, and she does so many things, which is extremely inspiring. That shows that if I want to be a doctor when I grow up, I could still have a family. Not right. that, you know, like if she, my mom's doing it, I can do it. And, you know, my dad, he's a great inspiration. On, uh, she, he treats my mother great, and he does amazing work with uh, marketing. And it shows that even if I didn't decide to go into medicine, there are so many other options out there. Right. So they're just both such strong inspirations for me to look at and listen to their stories, and it's so influential. That's awesome. And so, Dr. Taylor, you've got three kids, right? I think you mentioned it a minute ago. Uh, two girls and a boy, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you and William have clearly done some things right by them, as Haley just echoed a minute ago. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and, and you mentioned homeschooling your kids, all three of them, and mm-hmm. working. I, I'm just interested in hearing, you know, what are your goals today as parents? What's, what's your vision for, for the kids? My goal today as parents, both William and I, I think is to help our children become the best versions of themselves and to realize their full potential. I think that that's important so that they can be in a position to share their unique gifts with the world. What is some some advice or tips that you have for for other parents? Because I'm loving this. You know, I'm listening to Haley. I'm like, man, I can't wait for Layla to talk like that. (laughs) But (laughs) what what are some advice or tips, right, that you'd have for for other parents, um, you know, about informing and educating our children to to help them get on that right path? Yes, I, I think that one mistake that parents make is that they rely on traditional educational models Mm -hmm. to work for their children. I think that you have to really take a good look at your child individually because they're different. Um, The time they are in their lives, because it'll change over time. Um, Maybe this Montessori school works for a preschooler, but that freedom to sort of choose their curriculum may not work for them when they're in second grade because they choose video games all the time. So you intervene and maybe put them in another 
environment that may be more structured. And I think as parents, sometimes what we do is we kind of rely on external people to tell us what's best for our children in lots of different areas. And so we don't have maybe the confidence or the knowledge to even take on a a, a role like a homeschooling parent, you know, because we think that only this institution with these people in it separate from us can provide to our children what they need. Hmm. And one of the things about this the traditional school system is we know that it was established to create workers, you know, for for factories. And so you come to school on time. It's very you know, conformist. You know, you sit in a, a desk and you raise your hand and wait to be acknowledged. There's not a lot of creativity. There's not a lot of tolerance for self-expression. And that's by design because one teacher can't do that even with 10 kids. Doesn't matter if it's a low school ratio. So imagine with 20 or 30 kids, you can't, it's just not possible to tailor a curriculum for 20 different children, and children shouldn't necessarily be bunched together just because they happen to be born in the same year. What about their abilities, their gifts, their interests, what works with the family? And these things are not considered sometimes by parents because we delegate and trust these external people that know nothing about us, nothing about our children, with the task, one of the most important tasks of formulating their thoughts and molding their personality and character. So I I would urge parents to really take a good look at their entire situation. And that doesn't mean that school, traditional school, has no place. It's just one of the tools in an arsenal that you have to help educate your total kid holistically and not focus just on math you know, Mm -hmm. or just what, you know, one topic, you are raising a human, a total human, not just a a student. Right. So let's expand on that. Maybe were all kids homeschooled from the jump, from the start? They were not. So this is an evolution, right? Right. (laughs) So, So, yeah, when I, when we first had Haley, I was a resident. So Haley was in daycare, like at six weeks or however old they'll take them, you know, back then. (laughs) And, you know, my husband stepped in, but he worked too because we were in California and we needed both incomes because I was a resident. Then we had her in school and I started noticing um, uh, not really so much problems that I wasn't entirely comfortable when she got to about the third grade. Mm -hmm. So I felt like this is when you're supposed to turn up the academic rigor, and they were still coloring butterflies in class. Okay, but that's fine. You know, butterflies are important. But then the following year, she she started learning this math that was uh, non-traditional math. You know, every generation, right, they go through these changes where they teach something a new way. And my little brother went through that with reading when they went from phonics to whole word and then back to phonics. And according to my mother, he never learned how to read well. (laughs) So in my mind, I'm like, I don't think that we should experiment on our children in real time. Let's do some studies on the side with a control group and bring things to market when they are ready right. and not have the children in our country just guinea pigs to the whimsy of whoever sitting in an office someplace, right? right? So that wasn't working for Haley because we couldn't help her with her work. We couldn't help her with the long division. We couldn't help her because of the way the math was structured. So we had a lot of meetings with the teacher. The teacher was fantastic. The, the leadership of the school was fantastic. The system is fantastic. But they are kind of victims in a system that's not working, and they know it. Mm-hmm. So I opted to take her out of the STAR testing, which is our state testing here, so that they would leave us alone about the way we were teaching the math, okay? And they left her alone. And so we were able to teach the math the tr- traditional way, and she started to enjoy it more. The following year in fifth grade, I noticed Haley is this very outgoing, kind of a child that talks back a lot and argues <laughs> with you and debates everything. And I noticed that part of her personality diminishing mm-hmm. in the fifth grade. And while it may have made my life a little bit easier, I didn't like to see that. You know, she was kind of conforming and acquiescing to the expectations of school, which is kind of what we've been asking her to do for all of these years. And now that it's happening, I'm like, I don't know that I like this. Mm -hmm. So, you know, she started kindergarten when she was four years old. So Mm -hmm. I talked to my husband, who was very apprehensive about homeschooling, and he actually did not. Yeah, I had to beg him to let me even just try. So the compromise was I'll just pull her out for a year. I'll try it. If it doesn't work, I'll put her right back in. You know, she could go back in the same grade because all of her other friends will be gone because it's only a two-year school. It's intermediate school, so it's sixth grade. They'll right. be gone, and she'll go right back in and age-wise. Right. She'll be 
right on time. And so he said, fine, okay. And after he thought about it and I got all the curriculum together and I started doing research, he said, what about, what about Ian? This is our son who was in second grade at the time or going to the second grade. I said, he can join in too. And Hannah was in preschool. So she, it, you know, it was just kindergarten. And I say just kindergarten, but it wasn't, it wasn't that difficult to just throw her into the mix. So right. I homeschooled them for three years. And that's when, you know, the, and this, so this is up until last year, up until this academic year. And so Haley is taking the classes at community college. And Hannah, we decided to do a different thing. And we put her in private school because she asked to go to school. And a unique characteristic about Hannah is she's adopted from Ethiopia. And one of her things that she's always wanted to do because she watched Haley go to school up through fifth grade is I want to go to school. I want a lunch pail. I want school clothes. I want the whole deal. I watched my sister and my brother Mm. go through it. And now it's my turn. And you're saying, no, we're going to stay at home. Like that doesn't sound fair. (laughs) So... (laughs) So I had her at home for a couple of years, and then this year, for the first time, we decided to go ahead and let her go to traditional school, and that's been working out great for her. You have to look at individual children and do different things at different times. So knowing what you know now, is it, for Hannah, is it a case where you're supplementing what school is teaching her with other things that you have, have worked for maybe Haley and Ian? With Hannah, so the way I started homeschooling was I did a what we call tailored curriculum, right, a playoff of my last name. And we would do that on the mm-hmm. weekends. we do that after school and during the summer and, and spring breaks, Christmas break. And I would take them um, and horseback riding or, you know, do things that, you know, you don't do at school you wouldn't expect school to do. So with Hannah, even though she's a traditional school, now I'm a more sophisticated you know, educational consultant, so to speak. Uh-huh. I am able to find great things to supplement her um, classroom education. And I no longer expect for the school to provide to my child everything that I think that they need. Right. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. And you have my brain turning. (laughs) Yes. That's the key. I think the key is realizing that no traditional school setting is going to serve your child 100 percent and we just we don't realize that as parents we're told it works for us we're told that this is what you're supposed to do and when everybody gets home after a long day they're tired and you feel like you're doing good if your kid just eats dinner and like stays alive and clean and you know so you know so to ask the parent to become what i like to say an educational consultant the facilitator the coordinator you're not necessarily the teacher like your child is not sitting at the kitchen table and you guys are having a power struggle about how to write a cursive a no that's not what you're doing you know you are soliciting help from the community you're taking your children to community classes and to the zoo and to to library storybook time and things like that like you're getting out in the world Mm -hmm. and the world becomes your classroom not your kitchen table Right, right. You know, there's uh, a guest of ours that is had the same kind of passion you have in your voice about this very topic, uh, Nick Childs, uh, who was on a episode a, a couple episodes ago, and you know he was basically echoing the same general message that you know we can't leave things on a default mode, and mm-hmm. so I, I really feel like. There's a, a confirmation in your message to his um, mm-hmm. that, you know, I really do need to engage more in, um, mm-hmm. in, in, in what we are allowing our kids to, um, to get by on in terms of, yeah. of their education. I appreciate you sharing that. Haley, I mean, yes. I, I, have, I have you quiet here. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> your mom touched on something pretty interesting here that you're in college today, right? Community college. Mm-hmm. Yes, at, I am in college. At 14 years old? Yes. That's awesome. That's awesome. I migrated here from Jamaica when I was 16. And so I was in community college at 16. And I can appreciate some of the, the, the challenges, right? Uh, you know, you yes. probably get by just fine on, on the classes. But are, are you doing classes online or are you physically attending classes on a campus? I'm physically attending uh, classes at a campus. Nice. And you're enjoying it? Yeah, it's really fun. And uh, yeah. so so what are you working towards right now? I know that your goal is to, to go to med school. Yes. Uh, right now, it starts with minor goals. Right. Like my finals are coming up and I want to get an A on all of those. Nice. But my major goals are, like you said, getting into medical school, then residency, and eventually becoming a doctor. So nice. a lot of nice. little goals on the way. 
how would you describe yourself as a, a student, uh, both socially and, and academically? I would describe myself socially as I am active in groups that I'm participating in right now, nice. such as Jack and Jill and my Roars Club. Uh, those are just two examples of time that I spend with kids my age. So socially, I think I'm okay because a lot of a lot of the time I get asked, well, what, well, how do you get to spend time with kids your own age? How do you get to socialize? What mm-hmm. about high school and missing out on prom and stuff like that? And I get to go to a lot of dances, and I get to engage with a lot of other girls and boys, but mostly girls because of my Roars Club, uh, that are my age. So I get a lot of interaction that I guess people just don't see or consider because I've skipped high school. And then academically, I would say that I have improved greatly when I jumped from my middle school, high school to the college experience that I'm going through right now, right. Uh, I feel like all of my study habits have greatly improved. All of my, uh, all everything I know has greatly improved, of course. Mm. Uh, I feel like high school, public, public high school is not necessarily great preparation for college. Just because public high school is so structured and the teachers take role every day and they care. And if you're not there, everybody freaks. And, you know, it's like it's it's everybody's all in. And then when you get to college, it's not like nobody's all in. and They still take role. But if you're not there, you're not there. The teacher doesn't, like, stop class and call your parents because you're not there. Yeah. You just didn't show up and you're not there. And you don't go. You get to choose your own schedule. So you don't go every you don't unless you choose to go every day. But you don't go every single day day, you know, from eight to three, and then right. you have the extracurricular from four to six. It's not as structured as high school is. Uh, academically, I feel like you do get a decently good preparation for college. There are some things that I feel may lack, but uh, majority I feel do well when they transition from high school to college. Not not when it comes to the schedule, though. I think because of the path that I chose, homeschool and all of that, right. I was prepared for college because yeah. I was used to getting up and working at my own pace, yes. uh, you know, eating breakfast. And instead of waking up at eight, I woke up at 11 and now I just study until six and not three. You know, so it's like up to me and I take breaks when I want and I don't have to. I'm not judged by what the average 13 year old or 14 year old or 15 year old knows. I'm judged by what I know, which is which is really why I like homeschool. So socially and academically, I think um, fine and have improved greatly. I was just thinking that as you're talking that the homeschool experience definitely prepared you for for that environment. That's mm-hmm. great. What's the, what's the most difficult thing you're having to deal with being in college at, at your age? The most difficult thing for me, for me personally, I would probably say I improved so much in such a short amount of time. Mm-hmm. That it for most fourteen year olds it may have been really difficult to change your study habits over three months of summer or whatever, change your study habits, get used to not being so structured, not being so involved, and you really have to be dedicated. You have to go to class in you have to even though you know your teacher doesn't care that you don't show up, you still show up anyway. And whereas high school, they go because, oh, I don't want them to call my mommy at home and I don't want to get in trouble with the teacher. Right. Whereas at college, you go because, you know, you have a test coming up and you paid for this class. That's why you go. Right. So I feel like for most 14 year olds, it would be a struggle to transition from such a structured environment to an environment where only your parents care, if that, depending on your age. Mm-hmm. So for me, the most difficult thing was probably just. I improved so much. I like just just everything about my social life, my academic, like everything about me just improved so much when I went to college and everything changed. So that it was it was something I had to shift to. Saying it was a disadvantage is a strong word, but yep. that's what comes to mind. Wow. Dr. Taylor, who is this young lady? <laughs> she's, I know. I'm she's listening so like, mature. wow, good job, good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Taylor, what what did you, we talked about some of this, you know, with homeschooling and, and even beyond it, but what kind of investment, you know, have you and William made that have propelled her, right, to, to now mm-hmm. working on his first degree at 14 years old? Like, what's the secret, yes. right? Like, I'm sure all the parents aren't listening in right now are like, oh my gosh, what is the secret <laughs> sauce here? 
You know, I think that if, if there's a secret, it's time. It's, you know, money and all those other great things are, are important in various degrees, you know, but time is the one commodity that we all have um, equal shares of in a day. And so it doesn't matter how rich you are, you don't get 36 hours. You know, you can't cash in, you know, your money for that. So time is the thing that... You're referring to time (laughs) spent with the kids. Time, yes. Time spent, time investigating, time thinking about what's best for them, you know, reading the tea leaves of life, you know, when God, the universe, you know, sends you a message or a feeling that makes you a little uneasy. You spend time meditating on what is this feeling? Why? Why do I? Why am I uncomfortable with everything that's going on with this child right now? What can I fix, if anything, or do I let it play out? And that's like a parent's dance, you know. How involved should I be versus letting things play out so that the child can learn what they need to learn separate from you? And so, one thing that I think that you know, I think that William and I did really well, and we do really well, is we have our hands on our children. We 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 touch them and. Look look at them and we listen to them and we're there and present. And, you know, we, we actually moved from California to Texas so that we would have more free time to dedicate to our family and to our children. I think that that's the thing that's sometimes missing in this world with busy parents that sometimes requires two people to go to work, depending on your lifestyle and where you live. Mm -hmm. And the time is just not there, Mm -hmm. you know, so you have to create it. You have to carve it out and prioritize it. And I think that that's, if there's a secret, it's just time. It's just spending time looking and thinking about and researching resources for your child. Yes, that's that's something that, you know, I, uh, both my wife and I are are fighting for. We're yeah. both working parents, but, you know, we, we fight for that time and I appreciate that. And we'll be putting even more time in listening to this wonderful Haley um, pour out her wisdom here. What what keeps you motivated, right, uh, to to continue to pursue more success for you and and for the kids uh, as a family, right, as a family unit, even after you've achieved so much to this point? Yes, you know, well, the achievement is not the goal for achievement's sake, right? Mm. It's a journey to enjoy your life and to focus on what's important, to prioritize what you say is the most important. And so many people say my family is so important, my marriage or my children, but they don't prioritize their lives to reflect that rhetoric. So, right. You know, so I, I'm not, I don't look at it as necessarily a success per se, because success is a definition that is kind of defined by the person stating it. Mm -hmm. I just continue down a journey and trying to do at any given moment what I feel like is best for myself, my family, our happiness. Like I said a little earlier, you know, trying to bring out the gifts that we all have, me, my kids, my husband, so that we contribute to the world the, what we're what we came here to contribute, you know, we're we're here and we have our gifts and we have our purpose. Well, how do you share that if you know you give up or you quit because of some arbitrary definition of success? Like that means you're done, right? Yeah. So we keep going just because life continues. <laughs> right. That is something awesome. I, I I'm just floored by all all the wisdom that you both have poured out in this call you know have to have to just express gratitude for for you both sharing your wisdom but uh, as we wrap up here i wanted to ask you guys you know one uh, what's one action that our aspiring trailblazer should take this week to help them blaze their trail um well i'll go first <laughs> sure i think that um aspiring trailblazers should be sure to choose their advisors wisely. Hmm. And you can start tonight by identifying potential advisors. And what I mean is, if you tell your dream or your aspiration to any random person, Mm -hmm. people are uncomfortable with people doing something different than what they're used to. So they'll try to get you back on their track 
on a on a road that they're familiar with, and they'll tell you a million reasons why you can't do what it is you said just now that you wanted to do. So you have to choose advisors wisely so that they hear you, they hear your dream, and they give you good guidance so that you can get to the destination that you were put on earth to aspire towards. Right. Love it. And I would probably say that you need to make sure that you're believing in yourself and you need to make sure that you're supporting yourself throughout your decisions and you accept the consequences. Uh, when when I say believe in yourself, I mean, don't let, like, like what my mom said, don't let others, not just advisors, but even your peers bring you down and tell you that you can't do something or try to tell you that you shouldn't do something or that it's not cool if you don't do something because in the end, it, it, it's your life. Yeah, so you make sure that you believe in yourself more than anyone else. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening to this episode of the Trailblazers podcast. If today was your first time listening to the Trailblazers podcast, I just want to extend a warm Trailblazers welcome to you. We're so happy to have you here and we encourage you to go ahead and hit that subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. Go ahead and browse through some of our past episodes to keep the knowledge flowing. If you're a fan of the podcast and today's content and you're maybe already subscribed to the podcast, please continue to share and invite your friends, your family, your colleagues to listen to an episode that you think might impact them most. We believe that someone listening to these inspiring stories will be moved to make significant changes that will have generational impact for many others, both now and well into the future. Don't miss next week's episode. New episodes are released each and every Monday by about 5 a.m. Eastern. Trailblazers, jump off this podcast today. Go find a way to rise above, go way beyond, and keep blazing your trail. Cheers.